Um, welcome everybody to a town hall with Sister District Mass, Rhode Island. We are delighted to feature Ricky Nkera, who is running for a seat in Florida House District 118. I'm Juliette, a volunteer and member of the Mass, Rhode Island uh, Steering Committee, and I'll be moderating our discussion tonight. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, a word about process. Uh, I have a list of questions you've submitted for Ricky. So after he speaks, I'll ask each question. Uh, you may submit questions at any time by typing them into the Zoom chat section at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to applaud at any time, uh, feel free to do the, the Zoom clap, which looks like jazz hands like that. Um, and just so you know, we will be recording and sharing this event. For those of you unfamiliar with Sister District Project, we are a national grassroots organization of almost 40,000 volunteers working to flip state legislatures from red to blue. Why do we care so much about state races? Well, for one, redistricting is coming up after the election. And now is our last chance to get Florida progressives into office so they have a voice in drawing state maps for the next 10 years. Uh, two, state laws affect our daily lives in every way possible, especially now. Uh, state laws govern most police conduct. States are taking the lead in fighting COVID-19, which is surging, particularly as Ricky mentioned. Uh, actually, as I've read in the news, in uh, you know, um, people of color and the Latinx population, and unfortunately, Florida's Republican trifecta is doing a very poor job here, uh, as Ricky mentioned, which is why we need more Democrats in office. State laws protect our elections or not. You may remember 2019 when the GOP controlled Florida Senate passed what was essentially a poll tax prohibiting over 1 million Floridians who had completed criminal sentences from voting until they paid their fines. This was in defiance of voters who had approved restoring these voting rights. Fortunately, the law was struck down as uh, unconstitutional, but you can see the potential power that undemocratic power grabbing state legislators have over the lives of their citizens. Uh, three, state level elections can have a huge ripple effect. Ricky's district overlaps entirely with both a critical US Democratic House seat and Democrats top state Senate flip target. So getting people out to vote in this district matters up and down the ballot. And finally, state level campaigns often operate on a shoestring, meaning our contributions have a huge impact. Ricky's a first time candidate who needs to get his name out there and of course can't canvas in person right now. He'll tell you more about his digital strategy, uh, but he needs help to really make it happen. Fortunately, Ricky has experience in getting his message out. As Sierra Club's regional press secretary, he leads communication strategy across the Midwest and Florida. He led efforts to improve water quality in Flint, Michigan, and is an expert on coal plant issues. He's also outreach vice chair of the Miami-Dade Democratic Party, and he previously worked as communications director for Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar, just as Trump was starting his presidential run, if you can imagine doing communications then. Uh, after Florida Governor DeSantis blamed the Hispanic community for exacerbating COVID cases, uh, Ricky was one of the state leaders out there demanding an apology. He is not afraid to speak up. Uh, Ricky is a Miami-Dade native, and excitingly for us, as he mentioned, he's got Boston connections too. He studied political science at BU and earned a master's from Lesley University. He is endorsed by the LGBTQ Victory Fund, the Latino Victory Fund, and US Representative Debbie Mukarsal Powell, among others. He's committed to public education funding, gun violence prevention, healthcare, and of course, the environment. The fragile Florida ecosystem could not ask for a more ex passionate or experienced champion. Now, I'd like to hand the virtual mic over to Barbara, who has some trivia questions to test your knowledge about the Sunshine State. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Juliet. Um, you know, we were, uh, most of us are Northeasterners on this call. And as we, um, before we were going to talk to Ricky, I wanted to see, you know, give us a little bit of an overview of really what's going on in Florida. I realized I don't know a heck of a lot about what's going on in Florida. So, um, 
I am going to share um, share a few questions, and we're going to um, run this as a poll. So you will have an opportunity to um, try to answer these questions. We're just going to give you a few seconds for each question. So this is just kind of like see what you know, um, and um, and and then you'll get to see the answers. Um, so our first question has to do with state birds. So every state in the union has a state bird, but um, surprisingly, Florida, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas all have the same state bird. So what bird is that bird? And you just got a, about seven seconds to answer this. Um, uh, and it looks like, um, it looks like we've got um, most people thinking it's a brown pelican and a few people thinking it's a northern mockingbird uh, and one person thinking it's a ruby-throated um, hummingbird. So let's take a look at the answer. The answer is it's a northern mockingbird. I was kind of surprised by that because that Florida being a southern state that it has a northern sounding um, state bird. Okay, next question. The Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, uh, if it were repealed, which um, our president is trying very hard to do, about how many people would lose health insurance in Florida? About 800,000? About a million? More like 1.75 million? Or 3 million? All right, it looks like most people think it is 1.75 million. Uh, and the answer is 1.75 million. Uh, Ricky may be able to give us more up-to-date data. I've heard it's a little bit higher now, um, but this is what, uh, what the Center for American Progress said at the time that I looked it up. Um, okay, Ponce de Leon, how many people remember the explorer from Spain who went looking for gold in Florida? He did not find gold. Um, what did he find? Did he find fertile land suitable for farming for a wide variety of crops? Did he find ancient silver mines? Um, did he find the fountain of youth? Or did he find a current so strong it pushed their southward sailing ships north? All right, looks like we've got a sort of a, um, most people thought it was the current, but a few people thought it was fertile land. And so the answer is that it was a current so strong, better known as the Gulf Stream, that it pushed their southward sailing ships north. Actually, I was interested to know that the only thing that really grows well in Florida is um, oranges, except in the Panhandle where you can grow cotton and a few other things. but. Um, Conventional crops do not grow well in the limestone um, in the limestone soil. Okay, <clears throat> Cuba is the place of origin of about 25% of the Hispanic Latino Floridians in Florida. Um, there are two places of origin that are very close in percent, or at least this is as of 2011. Of course, we've got a um, we've got a, a census coming up, and these this data may uh, change. Um, but as of right now, which two places other than Cuba are um, the place of origin for Hispanic Latino Floridians? Is it Mexico and Puerto Rico, Colombia and Puerto Rico, or Mexico and Colombia? Okay, I think we've got uh, most of the people said Colombia and Puerto Rico. So the actual answer is Colombia and Puerto Rico. Good work. I wouldn't have known that unless I had looked it up. Okay, which is not a real gun law in Florida? Is there not a three-day waiting period for the purchase of a gun? Is there not a requirement to register a firearm? 
Is there not a red flag law to confiscate guns from those deemed to be a danger to themselves or others? Or is there not a stand your ground law which protects individuals who defend themselves with deadly force if they perceive themselves to be in danger? Okay, we're going to end the polling here. And the most people thought that there was not a red flag law. In actuality, there is no requirement to register a firearm and there is a red flag law, which I found interesting because from what I've heard, red flag laws are among the most important ones um, in terms of uh, protecting people from gun violence. Although I'm looking forward to hearing what Ricky has to say on this topic. Okay, which of the below statements is true? Was Florida one of the 13 original Confederate states that seceded from the Union in 1861? Was Florida one of seven original Confederate states that seceded from the Union in 1861? Or did Florida never join the Confederacy? Okay, looks like we have a mixed bag of answers. Um, most people thought Florida never joined the Confederacy. In fact, Florida was one of the seven original Confederate states that seceded from the Union in 1861. May have something to do with that design of that state flag. It looks a little bit Confederacy to me. Okay, this is our last question. Um, which of the following is not a real iguana-related headline? Out-of-control iguanas infesting South Florida, or 80-pound iguana found in a freezer of South Florida pizza restaurant, or much-maligned iguanas are found to feast on Florida's invasive plant species, or falling iguana alert issued in Florida due to cold temperatures. Okay. Looks like um, uh, most people did not believe that there was a um, headline that said out of control iguanas infesting South Florida. The answer is that the much maligned iguanas do not feast, unfortunately, they do not uh, feast on Florida's invasive plant species. The other three, um, the other three headlines are all actual mm. Florida headlines. All right. Well, um, I, I've now tested your knowledge. Um, these are my questions for you, but now we can, I'm going to turn the um, mic back over to Juliet, who is um, going to ask some of the questions that we've teed up for Ricky. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I'm actually, before I ask the questions, uh, Let's welcome Ricky Unkira and uh, hear what he has to say, if he would like to speak. We're all ears. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, the iguana thing is, is not something that I'm proud of. Uh, there's actually someone who this past uh, holiday season, the iguanas falling and, and being paralyzed for 24 hours happened. And there was a woman who, who, who would capture them, tie their, their legs, and there's a, there's a iguana meat trade. Uh, it, it made it into the Miami Herald, the big story. And I was just like, wow, that's interesting. Anyway, um, uh, really quickly, before we get into some awesome questions, uh, I want to let everyone know that um, this, this is a family campaign, uh, meaning that we are grassroots, grassroots. And as such, my amazing year and a half older sister, uh, Jenny, Jennifer Castellon, is on with us tonight. Uh, she's been one of my uh, biggest supporters. Uh, and is a social worker for Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Um, I also have my longtime and undergraduate mentor and graduate school uh, hero and goddess and uh, mentor and everything you could ever think of in uh, uh, Dr. Laura DeVoe, um, former uh, Dean of Students at Mount Ida College and former um, 
associate de uh, housing director at BU when I was an undergrad and hired me as an RA. Um, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have been able to pay for uh, graduate school at Lesley University because I was working for her at Mount Ida at the time. So anyway, uh, just I wanted to make sure that I uh, embraced and, and lifted up those who have been there for me and, and made it possible for me to be here today. If it wasn't for my elder sister taking care of our sick mom, uh, I wouldn't have been able to have the privilege to go to BU and then go to Leslie uh, and then do everything else that, that I've been able to accomplish in my uh, young career. That being said, uh, I am a Cuban American uh, uh, product of the west side of Miami. And I say that and it's important in a lot of the things that you read about me online and on my website because what people need to understand is that Miami is not just the beach and the downtown and the you know the fast life and the neon green and pink uh, uh, signs that you that you see in the movies or in TV shows. Uh, we have a suburb community that's much larger than just the downtown Miami and 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 Miami Beach area, um, and and those areas are the ones that are hardest hit now during COVID. Um, I, I know it's not lost upon anyone, and unfortunately, it's made national headlines uh, that Florida lags well be behind every other state in approving unemployment benefits uh, for our unemployed. We, we have hundreds of thousands of unemployed Floridians who are not getting approved by a broken unemployment system. One that uh, Senator, now Senator Rick Scott, former Governor Rick Scott, created a website he created and admitted to just this past year, uh, admitted to making that website so that it would fail uh, to approve unemployment candidates uh, so that it would be an incentive for them to find a new job quicker. Um, unfortunately, no one understood that there would be a pandemic of this magnitude, but still the, the, the point that a Republican governor and Republicans in this state knowingly set these systems up to fail, uh, these safety nets, these, uh, these uh, taxed benefits that people receive and they, they pay into, um, to know that, that this, this has been happening um, is, is just, it's crazy to me. And um, when you have hundreds of thousands of people without uh, jobs and, and without being able to find a job, as everyone knows, you know, COVID lasted, uh, you know, just over three months with everything closed down. Um, that on top of the, the higher number of, of healthcare um, recipients or those uh, without healthcare, um, it just compounds the issues that you all can understand are happening now. Everyone saw that it was just about uh, 1.7, um, uh, what was it, 1.7 million uh, people that depend on Obamacare. Uh, that number, if you include those who would qualify for the expanded Medicaid uh, program, it does balloon to, to just over th uh, 3 million uh, Floridians. So Obamacare uh, had set up to be able to have uh, an expansion of Medicaid, uh, but it was an opt it was an opt in um, uh, program for for states and many states like Kentucky, which I work in for the Sierra Club, uh, opted into expanded Medicaid early, which is federal funding to be able to expand uh, access to to Medicaid to not just uh, the poorest in our community, but those uh, at 125 percent of the poverty uh, line. Uh, and in Florida, that would that would help over 800,000 uh, Floridians. Um, so these are things that you look at in a state where, you know, I, I think our priorities are backwards. Uh, just as COVID was starting, the governor approved um, over $500 million in tax credits uh, to our 0.1% of our businesses, knowing full well that COVID was happening and that our budget would have a huge shortfall. And so now three months later, uh, it's no surprise to anyone that yesterday, Governor DeSantis um, announced uh, over a billion dollars in, in, in cuts to the Florida budget, impacting uh, uh, workers, impacting uh, educators, teachers, and, and public school systems in our, in our over 60 counties. And so, you know, things have a, uh, things have a ripple effect, uh, and him approving that money to the largest businesses in the state early on, and then now cutting the budget. Uh, again, uh, putting our, our most vulnerable um, at a bigger disadvantage are reasons why people are fed up. And in Florida, you know, it's not just Democrats that are fed up with, with a broken system. It's uh, no party affiliates or independents and a lot of Republicans. 
Um, and I'll end with this before the questions, because I know the questions are going to be really good. Um, my district is the top uh, uh, target Democratic or top flip district in the state of Florida. Um, Hillary Clinton won this district by nine percentage points in 2016, while the Democrat uh, in, in running in my seat only won by 56 votes. So you, you say to yourself, how can uh, the Democratic nominee for president win a district by such a landslide while the uh, Democratic um, uh, state house candidate only wins by 56 votes? And the answer is, and, and I think um, uh, uh, Julie mentioned it before, it's name recognition. It's being able to get voters to understand and know the name at the bottom of the ticket. And that's the most important thing in a presidential year. Um, I don't know how the ballot looks in Massachusetts. I always voted in Florida uh, absentee um, while a student and as a grad student. But here in Florida, it's, it's hard because the, the ballots tend to be, you know, four, five, six, seven pages. And unfortunately, the state house uh, uh, race is one of the one on the back end of the candidates. And then just before the county, um, the, the county referendums uh, that are on a ballot. So for us, our goal is to reach as many voters via phone bank and postcard writing right now. After the primary in Florida, which is one of the latest, August 18th, we'll start looking at the numbers and see where we are with COVID to see if it makes any sense to start canvassing. Uh, we know that 30% of people that we knock on their door answer, and that's a, a, an identification opportunity for us in the campaign. Um, and then that goes down to 10%. Uh, a response rate when you're calling people on the phone. And so canvassing is always the best opportunity you have uh, to communicate with voters. But now, post COVID, uh, it's, it's all of you, you know, Ellen, Karen, uh, Amy, Rachel, uh, Laura, Mary, Jacqueline, Elizabeth, um, all of you um, are much more critical to a grassroots campaign because we're not in the field knocking on doors. We're only able to communicate with people uh, digitally and, and mobile and on mobile devices. And so, yeah, that's just a really quick, weird go around. Um, but I know that I had a great profile read about me earlier and I know there's some awesome questions coming up. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I'll just get right into it. Um, from Lucy, how many people are in your district and what are top priorities for your constituents? So my district is purple. It's, it's the definition of purple if you look it up in, in, in the dictionary. Um, 97,000 uh, voters live in the district. The districts that are made to house up to 120,000 voters. And I say that because we're going into redistricting after uh, this cycle. So that's another reason why this is important. Uh, the district is uh, 33, about 33,000 um, Republicans. Uh, about 34,000 independents and about 30, 31 and a half thousand Democrats. So roughly a third, a third and a third with independents uh, leaning Democratic if they vote. Uh, there's a huge, there's a pretty big drop off uh, from those who vote uh, at the presidential level and those that stick around to actually finish off their ballot. People just vote for president and turn in their ballot uh, and don't vote on any of the referendums and any of the under um, the under candidates. And so that's why it's so important that we actually communicate to voters because just communicating to them will make the difference. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are some of your constituents' uh, top concerns? Yeah, so uh, before COVID, healthcare uh, has always been top of mind for everyone. Uh, it's the largest, it's one of the top two, it's it's top three largest Obamacare recipients in the country uh, by, by congressional county. And so uh, I'm very good friends with the Congresswoman here uh, who's just finishing her first term and she's done polling uh, recently and it's still top of mind to people, healthcare and, and having affordable access to affordable healthcare. Uh, more critical now for a state on the state level is uh, passing of Medicaid expansion. Uh, of course, that language is very polarized uh, because of national politics. Um, so we have to talk about uh, expanding Medicaid very differently. You know, access to affordable health care is the language that we want to use, uh, but that, that's top of mind. Um, second now is unemployment. 
you know, uh, we have a broken unemployment system. People are, you know, living without a job and without uh, a stable income. And so people have put off their, their rent payments, their mortgage payments, their car payments, their utility payments. And now in July, you know, when we have no, we no longer have a freeze on all of those payments, uh, people are going to be, you know, waking up one morning and having a very dire, um, uh, a very dire outlook economically. And we could be losing a whole generation of, of um, middle income earners because uh, they're going to fall so far behind, it's going to be hard for them to get out of that. And as a Democrat and as a, a future legislator, I'm looking at that problem and trying to find out ways to, to try and help people like that uh, once elected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you touched on this, um, but is there anything else you'd like to say about uh, reaching your voting universe right now, given COVID? Um, any, any particulars about your digital strategy? Yeah, so um, we have identified a universe of uh, persuadable independents, right? So, so people who are registered independent, but on prior campaigns, uh, run by other Democrats, have it uh, be uh, for the governor's race in 2018, or the congressional race in 2018, or you know another state house or state senate race in 2018 or 2016, right? The the Van database, the the Democratic database of of voter research has identified, right? Has knocked on these doors, has communicated with these people, have put in tags for them on you know how partisan are they, or how do they align on our issues, or how do they align with a particular Democratic or Republican candidate. And by the history of all of these aggreg ag campaigns aggregated into this voter file, right, all of their responses historically have given them a, a voter score uh, based on all of that data, right? Then what we do is we say we want to talk to independent voters who have a, a, a data file that says they are 60% or more likely to vote for the Democrat in a race because of their prior communication with canvassers and phone bankers uh, previously. And so that universe, we loaded into our voter file. And I know that you work with ORE, the, the, um, the sister district um, uh, organizing manager, and she loads that into your, vote, your, your phone banking universe. And we, we start calling through that, that list of persuadable independent voters. We do the same thing for Democrats who are less likely to turn out to vote. So in that same voter file, you can say, I want to identify Democrats who have voted in two of the last three elections, have voted at least in the last presidential uh, and at least one of the last two non-presidential races, right? So these are less active Democrats, but Democrats nonetheless. Right, and with them, the strategy and the script is a little different than the independents, right? Because it's not that they're not a Democrat and they don't align most necessarily with our issues, but they are less likely to actually get out to vote. Now, even more so than just phone banking and, and postcard writing, we are trying to then also engage with these voters to apply to vote by mail. So that obviously these voters are less likely to stand in line to vote in the first place. We know that based on the data, and we are also communicating to them, here is the link or here is the website to go and sign up to receive your ballot at home. Doesn't mean you have to vote at home, but it gives you the possibility to do that and the flexibility to understand that if you can't make the line, if you can't make it on the day of election, you can just fill in your ballot and mail it into the Department of Elections. Great. And so that's, that's the importance now. And obviously we can't canvas. So as many times as we can go through those phone numbers, again, a 10% answer rate, right? And so every round of calls that we do, it'll pull out those that we've actually talked to and only keep in those that we left the voicemail or that was busy or uh, someone who didn't answer. And then each round of those calls that we do will get more and more communication to voters. And then once we get closer to the election site, to the election, the last six weeks, or the last four weeks after the absentee ballots or the vote by mail ballots have dropped, you know, then we get everyone that we've talked to historically from now, right, at the end of the campaign and make sure they've made a plan to go and vote. And so right now we're doing the hard work of identifying people 
based on calling them and having a phone call with them. And then once we've identified a couple thousand people, the last four weeks of the campaign, it's just going through everyone we've talked to. So it's not going to be, you know, aggressive or, or voters that have never heard us, heard us or our name before. It's voters that have heard us before. And then now our, our job is not to inform them and get data from them to put in our voter file, but now it's to get them to make sure that they've actually gone to go out to vote. And again, in a race where in 2016, it was decided by 56 votes and in 2018 was decided by just 1200 votes, you know, a, a couple thousand voters identified now will make all the difference come October, November. Mm -hmm. Are you getting pushback from uh, state government about vote by mail as, as with federal government? So it's funny, right? Um, DeSantis, our governor, is in toe and toe with uh, the Trump administration. So he's pushing back the same talking points that the president is. But Republican leadership knows that if they fall behind on apps or vote by mail registrants, they'll, they will lose the campaign. You know, it's quiet on the Republican side, their strategy to have high registration and vote by mail. And actually, in the last couple of cycles, they've actually had the vote by mail advantage huh. because they quietly have been doing it. Now, they, none of them want to openly admit that it's important to their race because they'd be going against the, the, the governor and the president. And so now, just this week, uh, we'll, be we'll be announcing as Democrats that we've surpassed uh, Republicans in vote by mail registration statewide, which is the first time in a long time in a state where our governor's mansion was decided by uh, 30,000 votes and uh, uh, we lost our state senator or our, our US senator in Bill Nelson by just 10,000 votes, you know, having any any advantage in vote by mail uh, is critical in this purple list of states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, it's a very, you've got a real data driven approach. It's very yeah. impressive. Um, this is, uh, I guess, somewhat related. Um, are you taking any special measures to get out the youth vote? Um, or is that just, is that lumped in with voters? So actually, uh, the Sierra Club, who I work for and has endorsed my campaign, uh, just uh, uh, in kind did a contribution to me of a college uh, intern uh, for the summer who's going to be engaging with college students. I already have the American University College Democrats phone banking as well, so they would be uh, also phone banking the same universe that you are, uh, along with a couple of other college uh, Democrat um, groups across the country um, to not just talk to uh, younger voters. Younger voters make up, or college age voters, uh, make up about five and a half percent of my district. So 3,400 3, uh, voters in my district are current college students. And we have a very vigorous uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram presence uh, that is actively working on not just communicating with those voters, but engaging them and, and getting them signed up to, to volunteer. My, my field director is a year out from the University of Florida. Um, uh, Jose, who you see on this call, is a year and a half or two years removed fr from being the president uh, of the College Democrats, I think, or of the student body at uh, Florida International University in Miami, just outside my district. And so we have a young campaign. Uh, myself, I'm not that young, but I'm, I'm pretty young. Uh, and you know, with support of some of these other cool groups like Swing Left and um, uh, Run for Something that engages with millennials and younger, I'm working with uh, Tom Steyer and NextGen uh, on that uh, endorsement and getting NextGen involved as well because they've really focused in on uh, focused on millennial and post millennials getting active in in election cycles. So we're working at it. It's a demographic that you know, interestingly enough, doesn't vote, but I say that. To others, you know, you've never, you haven't seen what the numbers would look like if they had someone closer to their age talking about the issues in a way that they can, that resonates with them uh, running and engaging them. So we'll see how it goes. Right, right. right. Speaking as an old person, thank you. For <laughs> um, great. Uh, a question from James. The U.S. Supreme Court has recently ruled that it is unlawful to fire a person because they're gay, lesbian, or trans, a narrow but important victory. 
as LGBT Floridians are currently not protected from discrimination in the workplace or in public accommodation, do you think the Supreme Court ruling will have an impact on the Republican controlled Florida legislature? And what will you do to advance legislation uh, that will uh, end, end this uh, discrimination? So the, the great thing about that decision, and I know a lot of people are, are freaking out now, uh, trying to, to make sure that people don't overestimate the power of the Supreme Court decision, right? Um, I, you know, I grew up in a Miami that was not very kind uh, to openly LGBT individuals uh, at the turn of the century. And it's why I left to Boston. Uh, I Googled, I remember back then Googling, you know, uh, uh, LGBT or gay safe places and Boston was ranked one of the highest. Um, and so that inevitably led to part of my reason to go there although I didn't um, come out until my junior year. And actually, uh, uh, Laura DeVoe, who's on here, was my uh, you know, beacon of hope that, that turned me over to the Boston Gay Men's Chorus, where I came out of the closet and became more confident and comfortable in who I was. And, and, I, and I thank them for it, and I'll start tearing up if I talk more about that. But uh, what you need to know in Florida, just last session, uh, there was four bills uh, that Republicans brought up to try and challenge LGBT protections and rights. Um, we had a trans, trans, bill, trans bathroom bill uh, that tried to make it through the, legis the state legislator. It actually originated from the Republican that held this, this uh, state house seat um, back in 2016. Um, we had a, a bill uh, making it illegal for um, uh, medical professionals to provide assistance uh, to trans youth. Um, that made it on to, um, uh, to, to that made it on uh, to the to legislators' desks. Uh, thankfully, one of my uh, Democratic colleagues uh, has a trans daughter and gave a, a very emotional speech on the on the House floor uh, that got you know emotional reactions from even the the hardest um, um, Republicans. And so it shouldn't take allies having to go through those lengths um, to get to, to defeat these bills. In the state legislator, and I tell my friends, and I tell my colleagues, and I tell my 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 coworkers that representation matters, right? Uh, seeing me uh, sitting next to them, being openly LGBT individual, matters. Uh, right now, if we did not elect another uh, LGBT uh, person into the state legislator, we would have only two uh, representatives in a, a, a house of 120 members. Uh, and currently, we have no LGBT individual, LGBTQ individuals in the state Senate. And so you can imagine that representation matters a lot. And I say that because this decision by the Supreme Court does protect uh, gay, lesbian, queer, and transgender members of our, uh, uh, of our communities from discrimination based on uh, uh, sex and gender representation. But that doesn't mean that it's going to equally cover everyone in every state. Uh, and so what we what we know is, and and in the women's rights movement, uh, we've seen a lot of conversations around that as well, right? While women are protected, uh, have they really been protected? Uh, and so the same thing can be said and understood about the LGBT community. So while there might be a, a more of a covert attempt at some of this, uh, one of them, and the the one that you you all might have read about, uh, is the religious exemption um, to to all of these protections. Uh, and that's something that we are going to have to litigate, right? Uh, and and that's something that the Supreme Court decision made 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 a point to say that they were not uh, responding to because it wasn't a part of that particular case. But there is another case um, um, before the Supreme Court uh, that talks about um, uh, religious uh, exception, uh, and we're going to have to continue to litigate that, and we're going to have to continue protecting our our, our LGBT um, uh, members of our community, especially on something like conversion therapy, right? where um, you have bans not just on um, uh, uh, religious spaces, but then you also have uh, language in a lot of these bills that says um, uh, that you know, uh, conversion therapy cannot be performed by anyone other than uh, a physician or uh, uh, an in-house um, uh, professional, but allows in that reading of the text, um, religious professionals and not just uh, uh, health um, professionals. And so that's the loophole as well that they found with uh, something like conversion therapy. And so we have to, again, work on all these smaller things. Yes, it's a huge win. 
yes, a lot in the community that's been fighting for this for a very long time is saying, you know, pump on the brakes, you know, don't celebrate too hard because there's still a lot of work to do. And so there's a, there's a happy medium there. But again, none of that happy medium even happens if you don't have representation to fight for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Barbara M asks, uh, what will you do about gun laws? Yeah, um, that topic is, is one that unfortunately most of us have felt uh, in, in those conversations. I was living and working in DC in 2017 um, uh, when we had the Pulse nightclub shooting. Uh, and I remember just like all the other, you know, uh, LGBT members of my staff that were from Florida, um, you know, were, were waiting on pins and needles to hear who, who had survived and, and who had not. And unfortunately, one of my friends was the first announced casualty there. Um, and as the reports came out and as people were communicating about the things that led to that shooting, um, you know, it made it very apparent to me that that, that, that gentleman should have never had access to uh, a weapon, uh, let alone an, an assault rifle. Um, and, you know, I know we talk about bump stocks and, and, and um, doing away with bump stocks. And actually in Florida, they passed uh, a, bump, a bump stocks bill, which is great on its face uh, for Republicans that want to placate the NRA by not uh, banning assault rifles outright. Um, but it's not enough. You know, we saw with the Parkland shooting, uh, other issues come up. Uh, I helped the students at Parkland, uh, at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, um, learn how to engage with the media. Uh, media was taking advantage of those student survivors uh, for the first couple of weeks. And so the, the Miami-Dade Democratic Party under my leadership took them in and had a formal training on how to engage on, on social media, you know, as an activist and, ad, and, and as an advocate. Um, and it was a great exercise, but you, you learned that we have now a new generation uh, that's been impacted in a very different way. I remember how I felt and where I was my sophomore year of high school when I saw uh, the planes uh, hit the Twin Towers in New York and everything that came after that and how impactful that was to me. And I say to people, you know, that is the same kind of fear and that is the same kind of experience, uh, but more, much more personal and much more, uh, much more mentally harming uh, at Pulse, or not at Pulse, at, at Parkland with those students. But it's created in them a lot of the same vigor that was created in, in my generation uh, for you know government uh, holding government accountable uh, and and you know understanding and communicating you know why why there was an anti-war movement after 9/11, um, but I think that we need mental health checks in uh, to protect against students like the Parkland shooter uh, from even being able to access a gun. That student was identified several times uh, by an in-school therapist uh, to have uh, um, mental health issues. Uh, that caused depression and anxiety and anger uh, that should have been flagged you know well beforehand and should have been um, made so he wouldn't be able to go to a a, a gun store or, or a gun show and, and purchase a, a, a firearm which is what he did uh, in in pulse uh, the person uh, uh, was identified by the FBI and others um, and and was on a watch list but uh, but we did not have the red flag law at the time and obviously we have a red flag law now because of that specific incident itself. And so while we have patchwork being done, right, um, there, there's no unequivocal uh, bipartisan uh, pledge to ban assault weapons, to provide the, the financial structure in the budget, uh, to increase mental health services in our public school systems, um, and to adequately uh, protect and educate teachers and, and security officers and, and the entire, um, uh, the entire system on how to how to handle this. We, we've never thought of it from a holistic, holistic approach. We've thought about it at, <clears throat> from a reactionary um, standpoint. Until we look at the holistic way, until we look into actually funding these things, and that's something that Republicans don't like to talk about. You know, fully funding things like public education, uh, like protecting our 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 children, and not arming teachers. And so again, uh, this is another conversation where there's a lot of parts to it. I talk to Moms Demand Action, and I'm a Moms Demand uh, Gun Sense candidate. Um, and I talk to <clears throat> Mothers Fighting for Justice and all these other groups because it's not just mass shootings. You know, we have to talk about the other end of the spectrum, which is um, you know in community uh, 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 gang related and other um, related shootings that happen a lot as well. And while they do not um, have the same uh, 
they don't have the same uh, starting point or or lead into why they happen. Um, it's still the same access and um, um, and, and um, you know pre-screenings and so on for for even own, owning a gun in the first place. And so we can do a lot of uh, holistic approaches to make sure that these people do not have access to guns, and that will include both both um, both sides and go on from there. Let me repeat, there are, Kai asks, uh, there are many threats to women's reproductive rights in this current political climate. What, what will you do? Where do you stand? Yeah, and I, I stand with uh, uh, Planned Parenthood um, at Sierra Club C, uh, uh, DC. We, we would host uh, Planned Parenthood for the Women's March every year. Um, and it was a crazy, there are crazy times, but very passionate and powerful stories. Uh, from women all across the country and and it's not even that for me you know as a as a gay young cuban american male uh who was proudly raised by a, a cuban grandmother a cuban american single parent mother and an older sister who's on this call um i can never say to any of them in there and look them eye to eye and say that i have any right um to tell them how to to take care of their body and what's best what's the best decision for them um, I also had the unfortunate event of having to hold a friend of mine's hand as she went into Planned Parenthood, uh, my senior year of senior year in college, and I don't think it you, you understand these things until you're put in those situations um, to even have an opinion in this way. Uh, but again, I I don't feel that we should have an opinion to begin with. But understanding, you know, someone at at my age at the time, 20, 20 21 years old, uh, having to make a decision like that. Uh, and understanding where they are in their education and where, where their life is going and and what the impact of making this decision without you know supportive parents without a supportive um, uh, partner uh, especially in a time when you're in college it's a it's one of the hardest decisions you'll, you'll ever make and we shouldn't make it harder uh, by putting social pressures and religious pressures on a, on a woman um, to have to make that decision uh, more awkward and more painful than it already is um, and so that's that's my stance I don't have to get very political about it. Uh, it's just personal to me. Thank you. Um, Bar Barbara Kay asks, uh, what environmental issues do you consider to be most pressing for Florida right now, aside from the iguanas, of course? <laughs> that, that was a funny question to, to end in. Where you got it from, I don't know. But anyway, um, for me, or, or for, for our community, and for a lot of places, uh, water, access to clean drinking water. Uh, and I know in, in many cases people don't think about it because you have your Aquafina and you have your bottled water at the store. Um, but it's access to clean drinking water uh, naturally and, and in your state, right? Uh, here in Florida, unfortunately, uh, more than our orange industry, we have a very large sugarcane industry uh, that, that pumps pesticides on their fields like you could never imagine that leaches off into our groundwater uh, just, just north of Lake Okeechobee, and, which is our largest source of clean drinking water, and the Everglades. You might have heard of something that we used as Democrats in 2018, uh, the Red Tide. Um, it was actually an environmental uh, catastrophe that was made because of the pesticides and the, the pollution that agriculture, Big Ag uh, was having on, on Central and South Florida. Um, that leached off into the Everglades and poured out uh, through the Everglades uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. That's much more standing water than it is free flowing like you would see on the, on the, on the Atlantic Ocean side. And so we have this red algae problem uh, that, that again goes directly back to clean drinking water, right? Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest, if, it's, if not the biggest uh, issue here in the state of Florida is access to clean drinking water and, and securing uh, our, the, the, our drinking water resources for future generations. Right now, we're seeing uh, that we might not be able to secure or, or assure that we have enough drinking water, uh, clean drinking water for, for, our, um, uh, for our residents through 2040. Uh, by 2040, 2045, we're gonna be looking at having a larger population uh, than, than uh, available clean drinking water. And so we have to find ways to mitigate uh, and, and roll back some of these uh, uh, toxic um, uh, algae growths and so on and so forth. But I think, again, it leads with leadership. You know, I work in the reddest states in, in the country for Sierra Club. I'm, I, I manage and I set our messaging and communication strategy 
in Ohio, in Indiana, in Kentucky, in Tennessee, uh, in Missouri, uh, in Missouri, um, Michigan, and Minnesota. And I constantly have to work with state legislators on the House and Senate side to try and pass environmental protections, especially now as the federal government is rolling back those protections federally, saying it's economics, right? It, it's purely economic and, and you resonate with Republicans in that way. And I think that's what I bring to the table. And I've talked about this. I talked about this with Future Now and, and Run for Something and Swing Left in conversations I've had with them is, you know, in Zooms like this. We need Democrats in the Florida legislature that will give Republicans an opportunity to lead on environmental issues. But it's not going to be from, you know, the environmental message point of climate change and polar bears and ice caps. It's going to be uh, purely economic based you know, uh, 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 finite resources of clean drinking water and the degradation of our, of our water resources and, and of our Everglades, our natural spaces. And so those are the things that resonates with, resonate with the Republicans. I'm the perfect person to give them a way to com communicate that to that con their conservative base. That actually is the perfect segue um, to the next two questions, uh, which relate to how will your progressive commitments to environment, public education, et cetera, um, be presented in a way that opens the public's minds and eyes, turns the public into a group of mass voters, and shifts the overall political landscape and psychology of Florida? Florida is a tough state to be progressive in, so I would like to support a way to present new ide ideas to old minds and hearts. That's from Jacqueline and Susan has a similar question. What skills would you bring to the office that would encourage the development of pro productive compromise for wildly different views? Yeah, and, and, and that touches again on what I just uh, clued in on at the end of this last question. You know, not all Republicans are bad and we, we live in a very polarized time right now. And in Florida, uh, during the election cycle, you won't see a lot of camaraderie between Democrats and Republicans because uh, as Democrats, we have an opportunity to level the playing field in the state. We're 14 seats in the state house away from uh, uh, gaining parity, 50-50 uh, parity, and we're three seats away in the Senate from gaining that 50-50 parity. And that's very important right now as we go into conversations next year about redistricting all of the, the state and federal districts um, uh, post uh, the census. And so it's very important right now for us to be thinking in that partisan mindset uh, to be able to have the numbers to be able to play in that conversation. But after the election cycle, when we have the Democrats and Republicans that have made it into the state legislature, and we are talking about ways to compromise, I think you really do have to think about things uh, uh, from their lens and, and to their voters. Um, gaining seats in the House and the Senate will actually allow Republicans to be more individually minded than a hive mind. When you have an overwhelming majority uh, or you have a, you have a super majority uh, in a legislative body, uh, power is concentrated at the top uh, by the leadership structure. And so many Republicans that might be themselves more moderate cannot vote in that way and cannot speak publicly in that way uh, because of retribution and because uh, the, the powers that be say that they can replace you just as quickly as you, you made it into office. And so actually by gaining seats in the House and in the Senate, we, we get ourselves to a place where it allows Republicans to be more independent. And so we'll see how far we get as far as pickups. My seat is the, is the top pickup target in the state that would get us closer to parity. But what I would say is, you know, focus on economic issues, right? Uh, people ask me all the time, Ricky, how can, how, how can your state of Massachusetts uh, keep on electing a, Republic, a Republican governor while you know being uh, uh, said liberal bastion, and I'm like because Massachusetts is is not as liberal as you as you think uh, when you when you when you talk about economics. Um, although, although they they helped uh, their neighboring state of New Hampshire pay for their education department, um, they are very fiscally responsible, uh, and even even on the Democratic side, very fiscally responsible. And so I would say a lot of more moderate Republicans here care more about fiscal responsibility and balancing the budget than they do about the partisan hackery that happens uh, with, the, with the more uh, far, far right uh, parts of their, uh, of their base. And so I think that already you see in Miami-Dade County where we have parity as far as our representation in the state House and Senate, um, we can extend that camaraderie 
uh, to other counties and across the state if we were closer in parity, but on economic issues, or, or on, on issues economically based, for example, on um, solar and, and wind power versus fracked gas and, and coal burning. You know, environmentalists, and we have for many, many, many decades said fossil fuels bad, renewable energy good, it's, it's just, you know, science stupid, right? Instead of focusing in more on the economic issues, right? We pay for fuel costs uh, every year and these power companies are asking for, you know, request reimbursement on, on higher fuel costs and, you know, pipelines and uh, pow power lines and all these different things uh, that keep on adding to your utility bill. Whereas clean renewable energy cuts out the, the, the fuel cost and makes it over time uh, uh, more stable and less less uh, increases in utility bills. And so it's that kind of messaging and, and getting through to conservatives and to conservative legislators in that way, for example, is what's gonna lead us to more compromise uh, and lead us to, to a more progressive agenda than, than what we see now. Um, on things that I see we won't have more common ground uh, is on the issue of um, uh, pro-choice versus pro-life because that's a strictly uh, religious um, issue here in, in the state of Florida. Um, but where we will uh, see gains is like what we saw in the decision at the Supreme Court um, uh, overturning the, the Louisiana uh, state law and, and where we saw conservative judges uh, agree with our, our more liberal judges on that decision. And so obviously we look at those, we look to those decisions and that language uh, to try and, and get uh, a return on investment on, on some of those more moderate Republicans in our state. But I think that's the way I would play it with uh, Republican counterparts. And obviously I have experience uh, finding ways to leverage uh, data and, and economics uh, arguments with, with them on a lot of different issues. And so that's how I would do it. That is a very smart and wily strategy. Um, that's, that's very smart. Um, listen, it is a little bit after eight. Do you have time for a couple more questions or we can also wrap it up if you do not? Um, that's good. Totally yeah, you're good? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, what was the most important thing you learned at BU? <laughs> so, and this is gonna sound weird, the Dean of Students, uh, who's still Dean of Students, Dean of Students now, Kenneth, Kenneth Elmore. Uh, I worked at the Dean of Students office all four years in college. And I remember as I was applying to law school, um, he got an email from the Dean at New England School of Law saying, hey, Ken, I saw this amazing uh, uh, candidate for, for our law school uh, who has, has your office on his resume, but uh, didn't include you as a reference. And I remember being called into his office and having, at, being asked to have a seat, close the door and have a seat. And I thought I was in a lot of trouble. And he says to me, Ricky, I just got a call from the dean at, at the law school at New England Law that says that you applied and you didn't even ask me. And he's got this personality. This is how he talks. And I'm like, Ken, I wanted to get in on my own merits. I said, you know, I come from a poor family. I'm the first in my, in my family to ever graduate from college. I didn't want to get into law school um, because of a connection, because I, I, you know, I had help. I wanted to do it on my own. And what he said to me then resonates even now, and I tell it to interns all the time. He says, Ricky, you know how many students I've never met before come into this office asking for a reference to grad school, to medical school, to law school, to the, to, um, to the Peace Corps, what have you. And I do it, I'm the Dean of Students. He's like, but the one person that actually deserves it and actually has put in the work and has been there does not. Ricky, this is, you know, the, the key word in society is social. You know, we are social beings. You get by in life based off of the effort that you put in and the people that you meet and, 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 the, and the impact that you have on them. You know, if, if you don't ask for that, you know, then, then you're putting yourself in a disadvantage in a place where you should have all the advantage. Don't ever think uh, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't ask for that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have that to help move you forward. You need to make every, you need to network every opportunity you get. You need to put your best foot forward and take every advantage. Uh, and I remember even reading Malcolm Gladwell and Malcolm Gladwell, if you, if you know who he is, you know, uh, would say it wasn't the smartest person or the person with the highest IQ that succeeded in life. Uh, usually it was the person in the median who 
not, not just had opportunity presented to them, but had the wits to identify that opportunity and act upon that opportunity uh, to lead to success that actually succeeded. And he actually ran a lot of studies to find that. And so all of this just blew my mind. I think out of all my time in Boston and at Boston University, that was probably the thing that, that stuck, to, stuck with me the most and, and has impacted my life exponentially, right? Because people ask me all the time, Ricky, how did you get to do everything that you've done uh, so quickly? And honestly, it's being genuine and you know, talking to people and engaging with them, listening to them for real, right? There's a reason why uh, um, uh, Laura was on and she just had to jump off and texted me afterwards saying, hey, Ricky, I'll get all the BGMC, the Boston Gay Men's Chorus members to, to help out on your race because you build a community. And, and if you build it through authenticity and you actually care about people, people care about you in return. And, and that goes a long way. And so I think that's the biggest thing I learned at BU. Great. You realize we're going to ask you to sing at the end of this, right? So you're ready? OK, good. Um, of the endorsements you've received, which one do you value the most, if, if there is one that you value the most? I'm sorry, say the first part again, you broke up. Um, of, of all the endorsements you have received, um, is there one that, the, that you value the most? Honestly, if not. yeah, I, um, the, the thing is, is uh, also uh, moving up the ladder in DC, you get to meet a lot of the same people of color um, uh, that are, are, are poised to, to make it, right? And so the current executive director of Latino Victory is a close and personal friend of mine, Myra Macias, who was just promoted. We're the, we're the same age. Uh, and we both are doing amazing things now uh, when you would have never thought this uh, three or four years ago. And so I say my heart, um, I, 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 my heart is with that group. Their, fin their national finance director and their executive director are, are two of my best close and personal friends and they are doing amazing things. And so any way that I can support Latino Victory and their mission, I, I will do. And, and I, I just love all the care and resources they've given me. But at the same time, the LGBT Victory Fund uh, uh, trained me in 2017. I did a, a weekend boot camp in Seattle, Washington, where they just put us through a grueling training about the, the, the highest highs and the lowest lows of a campaign cycle that really did set me up uh, to plan out this strategy and plan out this, this move forward. And I think that both of those experiences and those connections have led me to a lot of the other um, endorsements and connections that I've gotten since then. So I would say those are the two of the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, how do you draw contrasts uh, sort of in a nutshell with your GOP opponent? Yeah, uh, I think it comes down to leadership. Uh, my opponent doesn't, doesn't do anything, has not passed a piece of legislation, has not passed a, an appropriations bill for any, any, any of his agenda pieces. Um, and he votes down party line 100% of the time without leading on anything. And so I say, first and foremost, you know, we have enough uh, of these uh, hyper-partisan vote down party line people in all levels of politics. And it's just not, it's, it's not great, not right. And we have an opportunity in my district to not just have uh, someone uh, in a lot of these minority communities that, that are fighting for equality uh, and justice in this state, um, but someone who is a fighter and a leader uh, in the community uh, for all people. And so I think that's the biggest contrast between the two of us on top of the fact that his voting down party line on a lot of these issues has hurt uh, most of the constituents in his, in his district from healthcare and, and, and rejecting the expansion of Medicaid um, to some of the, the, the more uh, grave LGBT exclusions uh, legislation that, that they tried to pass in the last legislature. So I would say he's, he's just not, he might not be a bad person in person, and I would never say I, I, I dislike or hate someone without knowing them, um, but his, his voting record and the fact that he won't lead on anything is, is a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I could just settle in here and ask questions all night, and in fact, we do have more questions and I'll convene afterwards and figure out maybe how to get them to you so that we can, I mean, we're just, we're swamped with questions for you. Um, but we will wrap up now um, and I'll try to get them to you afterwards. And um, 
this has just been fantastic. It is so wonderful to meet you. And I'm going to pass the final word over to Patrick, who is going to speak to the people on this call about our call to action for you. So thank you. Zoom hands. Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ricky and, um, and Ricky's uh, staff and friends who are joining us tonight and everybody who's joining the, who's here on the call tonight. Um, I just want to finish things off by just with a call to action. Um, you've heard Ricky talk about everything that's so important that he's doing, that um, just the importance of him flipping the seat in, in Miami-Dade. And what can you do? Well, um, as Ricky talked about, pretty much number one thing you can do now is phone bank. And um, I, I assume pretty soon, pretty uh, soon we'll be phone banking for Ricky. We're not yet. Uh, I'm guessing that's going to start happening pretty quick, pretty soon. Um, but we have phone banks. Um, um, Zoom phone bank parties every Thursday night at 6.30, every Sunday at 4 p.m. So two chances, two opportunities to join us and make calls. And we have just a great crowd of callers, some of whom are on the call in this uh, um, event tonight, who I see. And just we provide um, lots of team spirit. We have a good time. Um, we share stories and experiences. And um, and honestly, it's just a, it's a great experience. Um, so hope you, if you're, if you haven't phone bank before, we'll give you lots of support. We'll, we'll even contact you ahead of time to get you all set up. So yeah, so, so really um, encourage everyone here to, to give it a try. I will actually put um, um, in the chat, I will put a, a link to our event page so you can see um, where you can RSVP for uh, the phone banks that we have. And we also have some other events coming up, something else you can do. We have another town hall coming up soon with another one of our um, uh, new uh, Miami-Dade candidates, Francesca Sesti Brown. Um, and then we also have some, um, um, uh, some really cool entertainment fundraisers. We have a music, a, con a, live, a live concert over Zoom, and we have um, an author book talk with uh, Alan Lightman. So just lots of opportunities for you to do stuff and to, um, to help donate to our candidates' campaigns. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is um, we always need help on an organizing team. We have a great, a great team that puts together events like this, but we can always use help. There's, there's lots to do, and we, we try to keep doing more. And, and it's hard to keep doing. We want to do more, but we need more help to do more. So um, definitely you know, reply to any of the emails you got, um, the, your confirmation emails if you're interested in helping out our organizing team. So yeah, so so that is it. Thanks again, Ricky and um, and and staff. We are so um, just so excited to be supporting you, and um, can't wait to start um, phone banking for you. Um, yeah. And thanks to everyone Thank for you, joining. Everybody. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, everyone. And my Bye. email, and my my social media is there. If you ever want to reach out, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with each and every one of you. Thank you so much.